drag and drop, Peter will kick off straight away without any formalities. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. You never know what's going to happen at one of these powder diffraction meetings. At Structure Solution from Powder Diffraction Data 03 in Slovakia, the conference celebrated a, a typical Zidar wedding where my wife and I had the opportunity to renew our vows. You might recognize some of the other members of the wedding party and the officiant. So you never know what's going to happen, which is also true of trying to index powder diffraction data. We start by reviewing some elementary crystallography of the relationship between direct and reciprocal lattices. This is textbook stuff, and I don't want to take a lot of time for it. In a powder diffraction pattern, the three-dimensional reciprocal lattice is compressed to one dimension, preserving only the magnitude of each diffraction vector. So the takeaway message from that is this relationship between the Miller indices and the position of a particular diffraction peak these metric parameters A through F are determined by the lattice parameters of the crystal structure in question, and you can go either way uh, with, with simple transformations. So given A through F, it's easy to find all allowed despacings of peaks. Uh, our task in indexing is going to be the opposite. Given a set of measured despacings, equivalently the two theta values, can you find these metric parameters A through F such that every observed peak corresponds to some set of integers h, k, and l within the tolerance of the experimentally measured data. What makes this tricky is that this is going to be in the presence of measurement errors, and there are, is going to be the possible inclusion of extra impurity peaks. We hope we're working with a pure sample, but it's not always possible. When you read about indexing in papers or in internet chat groups, the discussion often seems to be about algorithms, tests of one program or another's ability to convert a list of numbers to a unit cell, and that completely misses the point, I believe. Indexing is a data-driven enterprise. You start with data, and the quality of the data is paramount to your success. The best program in the world cannot help you if it starts with crummy data. And so you have to start asking whether the instrument that produces the data that you're trying to work with, does it produce indexable data? Basically, that requires being able to determine the positions of diffraction peaks with an accuracy on the order of a hundredth of a degree, which is not so easy. This places stringent requirements to minimize errors of the diffractometer zero, sample displacement, sample transparency. And the best way to find out uh, if you can do this is to try it by measuring a test sample uh, with similar properties to your re real research interests. For example, if you're interested in small organic molecules, try running patterns of uh, ibuprofen or acetaminophen. These are both commercially available uh, uh, pain relievers. Uh, they're very conveniently available in pure form. Some samples of ibuprofen have, have small amounts of uh, lactose hydrate included as an excipient, but all the acetaminophen tablets that I've seen have been free of any crystalline impurity. So here's data from the synchrotron that we're going to be uh, using in, in some of the demonstrations that I'm going to be doing later. You don't necessarily need data this good to succeed, but you ought to be able to find an indexed pattern, you ought to be able to index the pattern from the instrument that you are working with. So indexing pattern algorithms generally depend upon the low angle part of the pattern. There's a blow up in the first few peaks of that acetaminophen pattern. Low, this is because low angle peaks have low indices and the pattern is relatively uncluttered, so you can pick out individual peak positions. Note the asymmetry of these low angle peaks due to axial divergence. That's a straightforward optical property of the diffractometer I'm using and is easily compensated for in any peak fitting program, but it indicates the importance of fitting peaks rather than just picking off uh, peak positions by eye. Successful matching a candidate solution to experimental data is going to be measured with a figure of merit. There are several in use, but they essentially all descend from this one by DeWolf. Working with, with Q, as we frequently do in indexing, one over the d-spacing squared of, of each given peak, P 
The wolf suggests to look at the first 20 indexed lines and calculate the average difference in Q between observed and calculated, and then combining them into a figure of merit like this, the Q of the 20th observed line in the numerator makes this uh, scale free in terms, of, in terms of the size of the problem, the, the size of the lattice. And N20 here in, in the denominator, the number of calculated lines up to the 20th observed line, tends to bias the solutions towards smaller lattices that are able to explain all of the peaks. Uh, according to DeWolf, M20 values of 20 to 30 for good routine work on pure well-crystallized samples uh, was, was, was adequate to gauge success with equipment available in 1968. We often find much higher values of the figure of merit for data taken on contemporary diffractometers, but often uh, one has to work with at least a hypothesized solution with a figure of merit of that order. The first algorithm we'll discuss is embedded in the program TRIOR. It works by assigning indices to one or more baseline inflections and then computing how well the rest of the observed lines match with possible indices. For example, in this pattern, if the material is cubic and if the first line is 100, the remaining peak positions are indicated by these tick marks uh, and they don't work at all well. Could it be cubic 110? No, that's not much better. We're interested in whether there's a tick mark indicating an allowed reflection at each observed peak. So let's give up on cubic eventually and try tetragonal cases. Well, now we have two baselines to, to assign, and that particular choice doesn't work very well. Neither does that. You can imagine working your way all the way through uh, more tetragonal cases and finally giving up. Likewise, hexagonal. How about orthorhombic? Finally, the correct solution appears with this choice of baselines and assigned indices. We're going to illustrate the process on some data on a small organic molecule, methyl gallate. Here's the powder data on methyl gallate in Topaz Academic. I'm using Topaz Academic for these fits, but any up-to-date read belt program is just about equivalent. Note that the vertical axis is the square root of intensity, which helps to make the dynamic range of the data visible. Indexing is based on determining accurate positions for 20 or 30 low angle peaks. So I've made a line shape fit to the first 30 peaks in the pattern. Let's just run that. So here's a fit. We get the fitted peak positions accurately out of this involving uh, an appropriate line shape model. Note the strong asymmetry in the data from this particular instrument due to axial divergence. Note also that the computed model line shape fits it quite well. So we get those fitted peak positions, and I've already loaded them into a control file for TRIOR. So here it is. Uh, we'll start with 25 lines, which is usually plenty. Uh, the first line is a comment, a title, and then the data angles to theta, terminated with a blank line. Trier needs a little bit more information. Here's the x-ray wavelength. Choice equals 3 means that the data are input in values of 2 theta in degrees. I've already checked the highest symmetries through orthorhombic without success. So we have to specify to the program to look for monoclinic lattices. 130 here is the upper limit of, on, on beta. So let's run TRIOR on this. That didn't take long. And TRIOR gives a result with M20 equal to 31 here, which is regarded as a very good fit in many circles. There are zero unindexed lines. Lattice dimensions are given here. And if you just cast your eye down the list of observed and calculated two thetas, you see that they line up very nicely. So you might be inclined to accept this fit. But you can't really take a lattice seriously until you look at how it fits the original data. So I'm going to load those lattice parameters 
into a line shape fit. And run that. Here the lattice parameters are adjusted, and so instead of some 25 different peak positions, Topaz is adjusting four metric parameters. And this fit has some serious problems. Differences on the order of a few hundredths of a degree in the low angle peaks really do show up uh, badly. And you can see that it just gets worse at high angles. Let's, let's look at... Uh, and, and these are all peaks that were given to... peak positions that were given to Trior in order to do the fitting. So there's something very wrong here. What happened here is that Trior stops at... when it hits a solution above its threshold, and in fact the program cautioned us that we might want to look for a better fit by increasing the threshold. So let's have a look at another... so let's, let's do that. Here I've told it that I need a figure of merit of 50 instead of the default value. And now what do we get? Here's a better figure of merit, still with zero lines unindexed. And if you look at the lattice parameters of this fit, you see that they are different. So let's put those numbers into Topaz and see if we can refine those and see how we do. And that's a fit... that's a fit that looks very much better. The background could be fit better, and I think that there are some issues with... the difference curve is noisy because of some issues with particle statistics, but this certainly does look like the correct lattice. So, the lesson learned here is that you cannot judge a proposed indexing solution by looking at a figure of merit or a list of numbers. You have to run a line shape fit against the original powder data. Another powerful indexing program is called Edo. Edo is particularly useful for triclinic lattices. It's easiest to explain how it works by looking at an example, so let's run this particular data. Again, we're starting with accurately fitted peak positions, and I put those into an Edo control file. Here it is along with some control parameters. You can read the Edo documentation file to find out what those parameters are and what you might be able to do to tweak it up, tweak its performance up to solve certain problems. So let's run Edo. Oh, that didn't take very long. And it has produced something that looks like a solution Let's see what it did before we evaluate how good that solution is. So, Edo works by, by looking for two-dimensional slices of the reciprocal lattice. It doesn't try to build up the whole lattice at once. It's much easier to find a slice, which is called a zone. So Edo is going to look for zones. Here it says that it's found several. And let's see what a zone means. If we take these parameters and turn them back into to values of 2 theta, you can see that the zone that it found fits several of the peaks rather well that are inside of the pattern. And it's found several such zones. Now, of course, two zones and the angle between them, if they're all correct, define the entire reciprocal lattice. And so Edo seeks to compare, to, to combine pairs of zones that index observed lines that are not in either. And if we look at the final product from doing that, we can see, once it's optimized those parameters, here's a comparison between the peak positions that we originally gave it and peak positions that Edo calculates, and they do seem to match up pretty well. So with the usual paternal advice from an indexing program, this is a solution that we ought to take seriously. Let's try to fit that to the original data in order to make sure. So here we are back to the original data. I've gone a little bit farther in angle. And if we just do a poly fit with that set of parameters, we see that that really is 
quite an acceptable fit. There are some little line shape issues to be dealt with, but it's clear that that is a correct indexing for this lattice. These two examples give us the opportunity to find out just how accurate data has to be in order to get a successful indexing outcome. Here's the data on the, on the example of the mesohematin triclinic lattice that we just solved using Edo. And here's another data set where I've applied a random offset in the range between plus and minus 0.01 degree to each data point. So let's see what that does. Well, this doesn't look very good. The program says not one acceptable lattice has been found. Uh, you can see that it thrashed around and tried some extremely large triclinic lattices, but it didn't like any of them very much. We're getting figures of merit on the order of 3.8. That's essentially what you get with a random uh, solution. So 0 0.01 degree random offset was devastating to Edo, at least this time. That's a random offset. It, uh, I mean, I did this, I prepared random noise on the on the data points. Some of the time with with errors with, with shifts of the same magnitude, I do get a usable solution from Edo about half the time. So I've done a number of tests both on the methyl gallate in Trior and in the mesohematin in in Edo and summarize them here. If you, if you apply a fixed offset of one or two hundredths of a degree on the data in TRIOR, you get correct solutions for a little while. You get this incorrect solution that we found when we were doing the original run some of the time. And by the time you get up to three hundredths of a degree, it's really quite marginal whether you'll find a solution. Likewise, if you put in random offsets in the range of a few hundredths of a degree, uh, you'll get a correct solution but not always, and if it gets much larger than that, no correct solutions found. For the mesohematin, the triclinic problem that we just did in Edo, it can tolerate a couple of hundreds of degree offset. Random noise in, this, in the data seems to be more devastating. I'm not trying to compare which program is more robust to this kind of problem, the real, the real point of this is to show that indexing programs really do require data that's accurate on the order of a hundredth of a degree. If you don't have data that accurate, you're just really going to have a very difficult time indexing your, your data. The third classic indexing algorithm is called Dickval. I'm not going to discuss it because honestly I have much less personal experience with it. I certainly don't mean to impugn its utility. I hope that some of its boosters can help us later this week. We have this wonderful software that gives you the answer if you start with accurate data. What can go wrong? One problem that frequently arises is a dominant zone, where the first number of peaks observed do not span the entire reciprocal lattice. We'll illustrate with this little troublemaker. Uh, it's a smaller molecule than its name. It will turn out that the first 13 lines in the powder x-ray diffraction pattern are all in one zone, one layer of reciprocal space. Uh, by the time that we get to the end of the problem, we'll see that the ratio of the largest to the smallest lattice parameter is 15 to 1. It's, it's a rather extreme case, but not, uh, not completely pathological. So let's look at this. Uh, let's look at the raw data. Here it is in Topaz. Uh, I'll point out that if you were not careful, you might miss this uh, first weak little peak, which is in fact coming from the, from the material. It would be unfortunate to miss that. It would probably uh, uh, impede getting the correct answer. So let's do a line shape fit to the first 30 or so peaks. I've already entered the numbers to do that. And here it is. Uh, let's zoom in and look at this a little bit more closely. So this looks like a, like a decent enough fit, at least as far as re measuring all of the line shape positions are. Uh, it gets a little crowded up there at the higher angle, but if you, if you look on a suitably magnified scale, 
you can see that, yes, all of these peaks are uh, uh, pretty well measured. There are some funny things going on with the line shape here that we might have to account for by the time that we finish doing a refinement. But for the purpose of indexing, I don't think those are going to cause us any trouble. Load those values of 2 theta into tree R, and it doesn't produce anything useful. Let's try Edo. Here's a control file for Edo. And that's not very informative. Let's look at the full uh, list file. And we see that Edo doesn't believe that my data is accurate enough to get an answer. It says that for the despacings that I gave it, uh, I would have to have data accurate to 0 0.007 degrees 2 theta, which it doesn't believe is possible. Well, at the time it was written, that might be correct. Uh, I have enough confidence in my data to know that it's true, but we're going to have to find a way around this. First possibility is to notice that it, it thinks that the despacings are so lar large, that is to say the, the lattice is so large, perhaps because of that one low angle peak. So let's look at, uh, let's make another file in which we just throw away the low angle peak. I've left all the rest of the data there. This might be an indexable pattern. Let's see what Edo will do with that. Ah, it produces a solution, but if you put that solution against the raw data and try to and, and do a fit, you'll find that it really is, is not useful at all. So the problem with Edo was that it thought for the size of my lattice, my data wasn't accurate enough. Uh, I might be able to hotwire that by changing around some of Edo's parameters, but there is a simpler way, which is to simply make the lattice smaller. So what I've done here is I've simply doubled the sine theta of all of the observed lines and put that into Edo. I'm going to have to remember if it gives me anything useful to remember to double the lattice parameters again. But let's see what we get out of this. Well, so this time Edo crashed, but on its way down, it gave me one useful fact. The figure of merit, the quality of one zone that it found, is high enough that I think I have to take it seriously. Let's remember these numbers, which are the parameters that span one zone that it believes that it found. So let's see if we can build on that one little toehold of information that Edo gave us. Here are the parameters that, that Edo found. The, the spanning vectors are not perpendicular. We see that because there's a cross term. Uh, the next simplest possible case then is that this is a monoclinic solution, in which case Edo's zone would be H0L. I want to find the direct lattice that might explain that. So we can take Edo's output parameters, and comparing with the fundamental indexing equation, we can use that to find out the reciprocal, and then the direct lattice parameters. First thing I'd like to do is see how that really does stack up against the data. So I'm going to use Topaz to do a poly, equivalently uh, one could do a Lebai fit, to this proposed lattice. So let's start out by looking at this one zone that we think we've found. I'm going to do that by just setting the simplest monoclinic space group, P2, and an absurdly small B lattice parameter. So back to the fit back to the, to, the, to the peak fits, and now instead of fitting 30-odd independent peaks, let's see how we do fitting that one zone. And I'm only going to fit up to a, a restricted, I'm only going to fit a restricted range of data, and up to 10 degrees or so, that really does fit very nicely. Uh, so, so I really do believe Edo's output that, that the first handful of peaks are explained by just one zone. Let's extend this fit a little bit further to see where that one zone stops working. And what you can see is that uh, it seems to break down here above about 10 degrees. Let's just go in and take a closer look there. 
and see what we've got. It looks like the first peak, we've got tick marks for all of the peaks that were fitted in that one zone. And it looks like the first peak without a tick mark is this one that we originally established at 10.447 degrees. That is to say a despacing of 3.843 angstroms. Well, the simplest solution I can imagine is if that were the 0, 1, 0 peak, the first peak in the, in the perpendicular direction. So let's just change the B lattice parameter to that value and see what we get. Now indeed I fit that peak as the 0, 1, 0, despacing of 3.843, but it hasn't done much in terms of satisfying the other uh, uh, problematic peaks, uh, the rest of the pattern that is not indexed yet. So life's not as simple as that. Let's see, I don't really know that this would have to be the 0, 1, 0. It might be that this is uh, uh, some other peak, H1L. Uh, it might be that the 0, 1, 0 is accidentally very weak, or it might be that the space group is actually P21, which would not allow a 0, 1, 0. Um, maybe it's the 1, 1, 0. You can do a little bit of geometry and figure out what B would have to be in order to make that be the, the 0, 1, 0. I'm sorry, the 1, 1, 0. If you set B equal to 3.874, then you can get the 1, 1, 0 to be at the position of the first peak that we're trying to explain. But that hasn't helped us with the higher angle part of the pattern. You can see that what we did was move all the tick marks down just a little bit. And so it doesn't seem that this is, uh, that this is promising, because we're going to need several marks. We're going to need several allowed peaks in this region and in this region to explain the remaining fits. So that looks like still a problem that we have to confront. The next possibility is that the correct space group might have a centering or a glide operation. Let me illustrate with uh, thinking about P21 over A. P21 over A has the reflection condition for H0L reflections that H has to be even. So if I'm going to explain the same peaks, I'm going to have to double the A lattice parameter. Furthermore, the 0K0 reflections require K even. So that first out-of-plane peak can't be 0, 1, 0. The lowest out-of-plane, the lowest possibility would be 1, 1, 0. And I can calculate B is perpendicular to the AC plane, so I can just use the Pythagorean theorem to find out what B would have to be in order to put the 1, 1, 0 peak at that position. So let's go back to Topaz and see how P21 over A works out. I programmed all of these in advance of uh, uh, giving this talk. P21 over A, there it is. Well, no. This is the 110, but there are not uh, I'm, I'm still not getting it with the rest of the with the rest of the reflections. It looks better in some places than others, but my task is obviously not finished. I think I'm going to have to approach this a bit more systematically. Here's a list of all monoclinic space groups in their various settings. We've already dispatched a few of them. Uh, I'm not going to make you watch me do them all, uh, but let's do a couple. Let's see, here's, uh, here's C2. That's not much better, is it? Uh, let me just jump to the end of the list. Here's I2. Now we're talking. That looks pretty good. Uh, might be able to clean up some of this remaining disturbance with uh, optimization of lattice parameters and line shape parameters. The thing I don't like about this fit is that there is a tremendous number of allowed but not observed peaks in this in I2. Uh, if we go to a slightly higher symmetry, though, which is 
I A, where is it? That's quite good. We don't have a lot of extra peaks that are not observed, and it has put all of the peaks that we want in the right places. I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with that. So I think we might have the correct solution here. Uh, you can put that space group into, its, uh, into a standard setting in CC or C2 over C with these lattice parameters. And in fact, we went ahead from that and refined the structure. The structure has two inequivalent molecules in the unit cell, and there it is. Let me show you one more attack on the same problem. Here's a control file. And let's just run it. So we've solved this problem with 20th century freeware and a bit of thought, but there's an update to the principle of TRIOR with significant enhancements. This is SVD index incorporated into the commercial software Topaz and Topaz Academic. It looks deeper to find the base sets, and it's clever about refining them. It's described in this software, in this publication, and you can see that out pops the same answer served up in the standard setting. Let's do another problem that turns out to have a pretty dominant zone issue. Here's a little molecule that turns out to exhibit polymorphism. At first, only powder samples were available. And before we get into this, I'm going to offer a handy little tip that organic molecules usually have a volume of about 17 cubic angstroms per non-hydrogen atom. So we expect 170 cubic angstroms per formula unit of this guy in the unit cell. That's the unit cell volume would then be that times the number of molecules in the irreducible cell times the number of symmetry elements in the space group. But we'll keep an eye on that in terms of uh, plausibility. So here's the diffraction pattern of that. I went a little bit crazy and selected 45 peaks and measured them. Uh, got accurate values and fed them into Topaz. I used Topaz for this problem. And to start out, let's see what it does with just 20 peaks. If you use 20 peaks, it gives a fit that's, well, unacceptable at the higher angles. You've, you've predicted a solution based on this information, and you can see that it just doesn't work for the higher angles. This is a serious dominant zone problem. You see we've got two very large and one very small lattice parameter in this candidate solution. You have to go fairly far before you come up with a peak that's not explainable as HK0. In any event, that's not an acceptable solution, so let's just give Topaz a few more peaks. We give it uh, 30 peaks, and now we have, oh, we have another problem, which is that it's given me a triclinic lattice. Uh, gee, I really hope that this problem doesn't have triclinic symmetry when we go to try to solve it, but it sure is a nice fit. So we have to take this seriously. Let's look a little bit more at the problems of a triclinic lattice. One is that I don't like having so many unobservable low-order peaks in a triclinic lattice. Triclinic space groups don't have systematic absences. So you can have, let's say, peaks that are accidentally very close to zero, but it's a little bit rare, and even when you look very closely at the data, zoom very closely in on it, there's no evidence of, of a weak peak being in there. Digging further, we see that uh, there's a suspiciously large number of multiply indexed peaks. The fact that 0KL and 0KL bar are essentially always identical, well, that says that alpha star is very close to 90 degrees, which isn't impossible, but a little bit odd. Uh, by the time you have four peaks lying on top of one another, that just gets to be too much of a coincidence. So it's pretty clear that this triclinic lattice is probably a subcell of some higher symmetry lattice. There's a great tool for looking for this, rather than trying to do it by hand. This is part of the computational crystallographic toolbox. Uh, run out of Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Here's the website for it, and I'm just going to cut and paste the lattice parameters into it and ask it to look for lattices that have approximately the same dimensions but 
perhaps a higher symmetry, and it has come up with several. Uh, the highest symmetry it found is an F-centered orthorhombic lattice, uh, and it's given, it's given those lattice dimensions. Here you see a couple of them have actually doubled from the triclinic lattice. That's the price you pay, I guess, for having a higher symmetry cell. It found a number of, of equivalent monoclinic lattices, and here's the triclinic lattice that I originally put in. By the way, if you indeed have a triclinic lattice, uh, this is a very convenient way to find out the standard setting for that lattice. But let's copy the lattice dimensions of this orthorhombic cell back into topaz and see how that does indexing them. Uh, well, it does very well. This is, this is a fit that's essentially equivalent to the triclinic fit that I had before. Um, and this is probably a good point to make it clear that this structure was not solved from powder diffraction data, uh, but rather from a single crystal. The space group turns out to be FDD2, so we get rid of a couple of absent peaks from the systematic absences for that space group. And still with this rather large unit cell, this is about 7,300 cubic angstroms, so that's, an, that's something like 50 molecules in the irreducible cell. Well, that's such a high symmetry unit cell that it, that it makes sense. In fact, if we look at the single crystal that was solved by Barsky and Bernstein, we see that there are three independent molecules in the irreducible cell, and it's a very nice structure. I can only say that I'm relieved that they grew a single crystal before I spent too much time working on that powder. Finally, I'll confess that this example is a little bit artificial. If I had just given 30 peaks to topaz indexing, uh, as I've done here, here's the, here's the printout, you see that not only does it find a face-centered orthorhombic lattice first, it actually even identifies the correct space group. So, home run. Give your indexing program enough peaks to start with, and it might really give you everything that you need to know. Okay, let's do one more example. Here's a nice looking data set of some sample. Let's try to index this. And we're going to do that, of course, with accurate peak positions. Let me show you how I get these accurate peak positions. I'm doing these fits in Topaz Academic. So it works from a control file that looks like this. I don't expect you to be able to see all the details of the control file. But basically, I've listed about 30 peaks. And I've picked off their positions just by eye to a hundredth of a degree or so. And I've assigned each peak an intensity of 100. I've given them common parameters for size and strain broadening. Here I've set it for zero iterations, so you can see what my starting point is in doing this. We run that. So it didn't refine any of these peak positions or intensities. I just wanted you to see the starting point of the calculation. The red line is the, calc is the model fit, and of course it's terrible. So let's now adjust positions and intensities. So I'll just give it um, oh, a hundred iterations will be plenty. And so now we run that. Good. So here's a poly fit, and now we have a, a set of accurate peak positions. This is actually 32 of them. Let's try to use that to fit the, uh, to find the lattice for this material. I'm going to use the most powerful tool available. Uh, SVD index in Topaz, and half a minute later, well, that's kind of disappointing. We can check those results, but that's not a very good fit. This is actually with refined lattice parameters, and there are just lots of places where it's no good. It, it's not going to bring those two peaks together to, to, to fit that one, no matter what you try to do. And I really don't like the fact that there are so many unobserved low-angle peaks here. So this hasn't worked. So it looks like this is not a single phase, that there's some other material present. Let's hope the impurity is a small fraction of the sample. So Lapidus is the person who grappled with this and solved it. But with the benefit of peeking at his answer, 
notice that there are quite a few strong peaks, strong, sharp peaks extending up to relatively high angles in this pattern. Let's take the 30 or so strongest peaks below 20 degrees and use those to do our indexing. So here I've skipped a lot of these weaker peaks, and Topaz is stable enough to give me accurate peak positions of, of uh, the ones that I've measured. Let's put those into SVD index. Here are those strongest 30 or so peaks entered into a control file for uh, SVD index, and let's see how that does. Now, that looks better. I'm inclined to believe that this first solution, monoclinic solution, is the same as these I-centered orthorhombic ones. It has the same volume and some of the same numbers, so I bet that's just reaching across the angle. Let's see how a polyfit works for these I-centered orthorhombic lattices. Now, here's a control file to do a polyfit from the lattice and lattice parameters that SVD index found. Let's see how that works out. Gone to slightly higher angle, and I would say that's a fabulous fit. Lots of junk here in the, in the difference curve, but those are all the impurity peaks. Look at that. Of the first seven peaks in the pattern, four of them were impurities, but if we go along here, we'll see that the peaks that it fits, it fits very nicely. So that really does reinforce my belief that this is the correct lattice and that there's an awful lot of impure material inside of here. Well, I hope that's going to be of some guidance to the, to the person who was making the sample. In any event, we are confident that the pattern is indexed correctly because Saul went ahead and solved the structure of this interesting 2D magnet consisting of metals linked by pyrazines. So, I'll just summarize by saying that when you want to index a lattice from powder diffraction pattern, it's crucial to start with accurate data. There are lots of powerful tools available, but no matter how good a figure of merit you have, you have to compare the proposed solution with the original data using a fit. There, even so, uh, proposed indexing is subject to confirmation by solving and refining the structure. Uh, there's one other thing that you need. Good luck, and I will send you with that, and thank you for your interest and attention. I'm sorry I can't be there now for discussion of, of this talk, but there certainly are other experts there who can, uh, who can help you, and I'll be along in a few days. Well, I'm, I'm tempted to shout very loudly, thank you very much, Peter, uh, for that. Obviously, it's no substitute for having him here in the flesh, uh, but he will be here, as he said, in a few days. So if you have questions, please store them up and, uh, and grab them when he does arrive. One thing that I would say is that Bill and I were very specific uh, with Peter when we realized that he couldn't come. We asked him to do something that was a bit different, something rather more than just a simple disembodied voice over a PowerPoint, and I think he has done a fantastic job and actually used it as an opportunity to do something different and far more interactive than he would do were he here in person. So, um, well done uh, to Peter on that. Okay, now we're only a few minutes ahead of time um, because Peter timed it very well and I've waffled for a minute. But it's now my uh, great pleasure to introduce our next speaker.